before all this, were you two coming into the Turing regularly or to the British Library, I guess? So for me, I was actually, uh, I started uh, last uh, March. So pretty much I managed to go to Turing for like a week and then <laughs> that was it. <laughs> That's a shame. Yeah. And as for me, I, I unfortunately have not had the, uh, the, the chance to actually step into the UK. Yeah. Um, I was in transit and then eventually had to come back home. Yeah. Hopefully there'll be time to go uh, to be at the Turing in the coming months. It was also sad. Uh, were you going to Turing regularly? Um, so actually, I only started the Turing a few months before you, but I, I was going in regularly for that time. Yeah. Okay. So I went in, I guess, in December, I think is when I started. Um, hmm. And then, you know, not for a couple months and then getting a little nervous around February and that was it. <laughs> the, the Shouldn't end be that. too far from Southampton, right? Is no, it... it's actually really convenient. Um, so I would just ride my bike to the train station, jump on, and it was, uh, it was about an hour and 15 minutes, um, which, which once you get used to it, you just open up your laptop and take care of all those annoying emails on the way in and that's it, so. Oh. I knew people from London that took them one hour and 15 minutes. Yeah, exactly. actually, that's true. Uh, I had some relatives who, who do that commute and just to get in, they spend that long and they don't get a nice train. So <laughs> they have to sit in the regular tube. Yeah, it was fine, no problem. So, I was doing that a couple of days a week, and then I have a colleague who's doing it a couple of days a week. Okay, yeah, that's that was a good arrangement while it lasted. <laughs> exactly. Hopefully, you get back to it at some point. So, to all those who are who have joined us, um, we will we'll wait maybe two, three more minutes until some more join, and we'll uh, we'll start. Um, but in the meantime, thank you all for joining. probably turn off my self view, but I wanted to make sure everybody saw the t-shirt first. Nice. <laughs> make sure it's in frame. I can't touch it. Um, Brilliant. <laughs> well, you started recording already, so we may as well kind of- uh, I'll freeze frame. Take a frame, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that could be the thumbnail. Yeah. So okay. where, did you, where did you get that? Uh, my wife got it for me for Christmas. Oh, it's amazing. Not, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure Amazon or eBay or something like that. <laughs> I get her nerdy chemistry shirts and she gets me nerdy fluids shirts. And <laughs> Good arrangement as well. <laughs> Do you have any other students who are kind of stuck abroad? I had to wait for one of my students. He was in Ireland until a couple of weeks ago. That wasn't that far, like, but yeah, still it was difficult, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Just meant that he had never met anybody in person, although he still hasn't met very many people in person. That's the worst, yeah. Uh, hopefully, Turing was uh, one of the places that uh, was pretty quick and tried like really quickly to deal with this, like uh, small projects, things like that, so that uh, people can meet other people at least online. Yeah, yeah, and 
they they were already they had a relatively good online presence with their the Slack channel and stuff like that. True, yeah, the Slack channel is amazing. Like with respect to Slack channels in general and how uh, <laughs> places use them, but yeah, certainly. Uh, Zach, up to you, really. Yes, I think I think we should start. Um, so we'll have some also some time left for questions. Okay. I'll, yeah. uh, first of all, I'd like to say good afternoon to everyone, and uh, thank you so much for for joining today's seminar. Um, it's great to see such a fantastic turnout, um, especially given that this is our first seminar. So my name is Zach Shvirep Conti, and I'm a research associate at the Alan Turing Institute in London. Um, although I'm currently talking to you from the sunny island of Malta. Um, I, I would also like to introduce my colleagues uh, and also co-organizers of the seminar series. So there's also there's Andrea Pizzoferrato, who is a who is an assistant professor at the University of Bath, and also Temis Botsas, who is also a research associate at the Alan Turing Institute, also in London. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the Alan Turing Institute, or as we call, or as we refer to it, the Turing, um, the Turing is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. So, since this is our very first seminar, uh, just very, very briefly, I'd like to introduce the topic of this bi-monthly series, and that is um, physics enhanced machine learning for engineering applications. Now, physics enhanced machine learning is, is an upcoming subfield in machine learning and deep learning that aims to uh, integrate known physical understanding of observed phenomenon into the machine learning framework uh, and overall advantages could inc include data efficiency and interpretability of of the models uh, which are vital criteria for real world engineering applications so on a side note if any of you who are present with us today uh, would like to share your work in upcoming seminars please feel free to reach out to us um, and we can of course then um, communicate accordingly um, as for the format of this seminar, so our speaker will talk for around 30 to 40 minutes um, and followed by questions and answers, which you can do so through the chat. So, I mean, you can try to use the, the raise hand, but if the, if the connection is, is uh, not stable, you, just, you, you can resort to um, typing your question into the chat. And I will, of course, then relay that back to, to Gabe. Um, so without uh, further ado, uh, I'll ask my colleague Temis to introduce our first speaker for today. And in the meantime, I thank you for joining us once again. Yeah, thank you for everything, Zach. Yeah, indeed, we're all like so happy for the huge turnout and uh, we're humbled like that so many of you gave us a chance to attend this meeting. So we're even happier that our very first speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Gabriel Weymouth. Uh, she's like very lengthy time in academia, uh, involves like uh, a bachelor in the Web Institute a master's from the University of Iowa, a PhD and a postdoc in MIT, a research position in the Singapore uh, MIT um, uh, Alliance. And uh, he's currently a professor in the University of Southampton, uh, but also the co-founder of the Marine and uh, Maritime Group uh, in the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, his research interests involve uh, robotics, uh, biologically inspired engineering, ocean engineering, and uh, the field that is more relevant to us today, uh, fluid dynamics and physics-based machine learning. So we're really happy to have him here today. Uh, as far as I know, he's going to talk about mapping of uh, three-dimensional turbulent simulations to two dimensions using AI and deep learning. And uh, once again, uh, thank you, Dr. Weymouth, for taking a chance on us and being our first speaker. And the floor is all yours. Great. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen. All right. Everybody can see that OK? OK. So, Hello, hello, good afternoon. Um, thanks for the introduction and for the invitation. Today, I'm gonna to be giving a talk on fluid mechanics informed machine learning. And I'm gonna not just focus on what works because I think a lot of times that's all that anybody talks about. Uh, and it would be good to talk a little bit about the successes and the failures of, of this kind of approach. 
Um, as said, I am involved in the Marine and Maritime Group uh, and also uh, at the University of Southampton. So I always like to give a little bit of an introduction when talking to a big audience uh, about why maritime is something that people are doing research in. Uh, perhaps you've seen some maritime news quite recently. Was the Suez Canal in your news feed? Because it was certainly in mine. Um, so the maritime sector is really, really big. The Suez Canal accounts for 12% of global trade, which is about $2 trillion a year. That's $2 trillion of money flowing in and out through that 120 mile long uh, choke point. And yesterday, or maybe a day and a half ago, it was blocked by this giant container ship, the Evergreen. And that was due to fluid mechanics. Uh, it got hit with a gust of wind on the side and went nose into the embankment and grounded. And it's still stuck. Uh, so that's exactly the kind of thing we want to be able to avoid. Uh, by having a slightly higher technical level on these things than you sometimes get. Uh, that's not the only kind of stuff we're doing at the Marine and Maritime Group. Uh, the main idea, though, is to really improve the use of data science and AI in the maritime domain. Um, it was co-founded by myself and Adam Sobey in late 2019. Adam works on soft computing and evolutionary algorithms, and I'll show you my work uh, later, but we've got a lot of other people that we work with as well. So we're looking at things like automatic design, uh, we're looking at data-driven models, port and platform safety, causality mapping for failures, all this kind of stuff. So there's a bunch of applications. Uh, we've got more than 10 industry and government partners now in the group. So we've got BP, Shell, Babcock, Siemens, ONR, that's the US Office of Naval Research. DSTL is the UK one. Uh, Marin is the Netherlands Institute for Research. ASTAR is in Singapore, et cetera, et cetera. So maritime is really a global thing. Um, and we've got a lot of global groups that we're talking to about this stuff. There's also some other groups at Southampton that I work with. Uh, there's the Offshore Renewable Hub and the trust, Trustworthy AI Hub. Um, so more specifically to me, I work in marine hydrodynamics. So I'm into fluids uh, and there's a number of different applications that I look at. There's things like basically ship and ocean waves. That was kind of my PhD topic and I still do quite a bit of work in that. I'm also involved in robotics. So this is a fun robotic vehicle that we just got published. The swimming performance of the robot as the piston is driven over a range of frequencies using a solenoid actuator. When the actuation frequency increases to approach the bell's natural frequency, the robot's speed and efficiency increases dramatically. And when the frequency passes the natural frequency, the performance drops, confirming the resonant effect. So that's a biologically inspired underwater vehicle. It's by far the most efficient underwater vehicle that's ever been made. Um, and it does that taking some bio inspiration and some ideas about resonance and mixing them together. Um, and it's pretty cool. It's got the same kind of cost of transport as the jellyfish, which barely moves around at all. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that I like to work on experimentally. Um, but most of the work I do is numerical. This video Oops, we did that. So the kind of numeric work I do uh, involves computational fluid dynamics. So that's, uh, I've developed a couple different methods in this. So a method for free surface flows. So this is a cover of JFM that has one of my simulations on it where we're looking at the wake of a ship and the air entrainment off of that wake. Um, and then also trying to deal with immersed boundaries. So this is the flow past three circles, which happen to be arranged and colored in the form of the Julia logo. And you can immerse these things by any kind of combination. They could be dynamic, they could be deforming, whatever you want to do. And we can do that with this boundary data immersion method. Um, and I've used these approaches to make a lot of state-of-the-art solvers. Um, so we've got HPC solvers in Fortran, and we've got some newer stuff in uh, Julia. It's a, that's what this one is, too. So I wanted to show you one example of one of these before we start talking about machine learning, just to give you 
kind of a sense of the scale. So that JFM paper involved this kind of a situation. So the model here is we're thinking about what the flow is coming off the back of a high speed ship. So we don't have to model the front of the ship. It's not important for this. We just need to think about how that flow comes off the back. And this is a shot here, a rendering of the free surface. So the water interface. And you can see that you've got an incredibly rich set of physics involved here. So this is a dry transom. So it's moving fast enough that the water isn't pushed up against the back. And so you get this rooster tail phenomena. You get converging waves from both sides that come together and kind of splash in. You get air entrainment throughout this whole thing and a diverging wake. Maybe we can move forward a little bit. Yeah. And then running these kind of simulations, it's just not that short. Uh, and you need to run a lot of them because we're trying to make things like design decisions. How does this scale with the size of the body? How does it scale with the forward speed? Uh, and in particular, we can see that in this case, we get a nice fruit number scale that converges and covers up all three of those so they all match. Um, but each one of those simulations took about 5,000 cores and 100 million cells and around a week of time on a HPC cluster. So while this is really cool and you can do stuff with this that you just couldn't do before, the question is, can you learn marine hydrodynamics instead of needing to do these extremely expensive computations? Um, it's not straightforward because this is a really difficult application domain. Those function evaluations are really expensive. So I just said a week on an HPC system gives you one data point. Um, the response space is typically nonlinear. The scaling that I just showed you with the fruit scaling is the exception, not the rule. So most of the time we're dealing with highly nonlinear changes in the outputs for small changes in the inputs. And good data is really sparse. I mean, the reason we were running those simulations is because you can't do good experiments of a system like that. It's too unsteady, too difficult to measure. The US Navy has put a lot of money into trying to do that stuff and eventually they gave up and let us do it with a simulation tool instead. So that makes it kind of a worst case scenario for uh, machine learning. That doesn't mean people haven't tried. So I've seen a lot of studies in the APS DFD in 2018, I guess it was. Yeah, uh, there was that was in Washington and there were, I don't know, felt like maybe a quarter of the presentations used some amount of machine learning to try to deal with the fluid mechanics in those applications. Um, and by and large, they were terrible. Uh, they were, you know, neural nets overfit to a laminar flow, and you can't possibly use that to do anything interesting. So I made some terrible memes here. The idea of using machine learning to solve a linear heat equation, like why? Why are we doing that? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. You're, you're showing that we can replicate something that I could have solved in real time. Uh, because I know how to solve simple PDEs already. So let's, we have to look for something else. And generally that's done by embedding some amount of physical understanding into the system, this whole physics-based machine learning idea, or in some places it's called scientific machine learning. Um, and today I'm gonna talk about three options to do this. So the first is a physics-based feature space approach. The second is this data-driven turbulence closure models. And the third is trying to use physics as a loss function. Um, all three of these, in a sense, you're trying to take the best of the black box machine learning approaches and figure out how to square the circle, how to embed some amount of domain knowledge into that without having to rewrite and neglect all of the good work that's being done in machine learning. Um, so this is our first one, this physics space feature space. This is uh, kind of an old set of ideas, but it still works really well. And uh, it's probably worth going over. So that's what we're going to do first. So the main concept here is to embed the domain knowledge 
from some simplified physics-based models. So you have some extremely expensive system to simulate or to get experiments of like that uh, ship wake that we looked at before. But you probably also have some much faster simplified versions of that physics that you could try to think about. For instance, if those two corner waves are ballistic, if they're just moving with some constant velocity like that, then that would tell you a set of scaling laws that these things should have. Based on their relative velocity and how far apart they start, you should be able to figure out what the rough scaling is for this sort of thing. Um, or an alternative, you might have a set of linearized equations. So the full Navier-Stokes equations are nonlinear, but if we linearize them, we can get linear wave theory, airy wave theory, or we can get potential flow simulations or some mix of those things. Um, and so we have those tools. They've been around forever, um, and they're, it's not a good idea to throw them away. What they can help us with in this particular context is that they can help us by generating a mapping from the data space into a physics-based feature space, a space where doing your black box machine learning is going to be much more effective than it would be on the raw data. Um, how exactly you want to do that is kind of a choose your own adventure situation. So the easiest thing to do is just to use those simplified models to augment the naive uh, features. But you can get more and more embedded and more and more complicated with these things. And I'll show you a couple examples. Uh, the kind of things you can do, which have been done before by other groups also in the literature, you can take those models and you can do a POD analysis on that, grab the most important components, and then use that as your basis space. Um, you can use a Taylor series expansion of those models. And if you have it coded, you could do that with automatic differentiation on the fly. So in a POD analysis, you'd have to do the whole set of simulations to find. In this case, you could do it uh, as the phi space ran. So these are the main ideas. I don't know, I hope this block diagram is kind of clear. I assumed I'd be talking to an audience that didn't need a lot of explanation for uh, the basics of machine learning stuff. So here, the blue is the data. We've got our standard uh, supervised machine learning uh, for regression usually is what I do, but you could do classification the same way. So we've got our X inputs on our Y outputs. We're just going to map that through these spaces. So phi is our X mapping and psi is our uh, Y mapping. And that gives us two new sets of variables, which since we've embedded them with this physical information are much better correlated possibly linearly correlated. So we can use a simple linear mapping now that we couldn't have done before, but there's no need for that. We can use any black box machine learning model we want. All we're doing here is the classic approach of choosing requires a ridiculous amount of data. And so this is a way of kind of turning a crank on some existing understanding uh, from the domain, from these phi based models that will help you do that pre-processing step ahead of time. And as uh, Zach mentioned in the intro here, the goal of this kind of the payoff is that you'll really reduce your data dependence by this. You're augmenting the kind of naive basis of the machine learning into some basis which is ready and it may be even linear and that will really take down uh, the number of data points you need. So here's two examples. Uh, one is nonlinear ship motions and waves. This was my first paper <laughs> uh, in 2005. So this is uh, a CFD simulation of a ship in seas and this is a nonlinear problem. It's geometrically nonlinear. As you can see, the waves are moving up and down. And as it does so, then kind of the size of the ship changes. And it's nonlinear in a fluid mechanical sense because of all the damping and added mass that you have. And this is changing as you move. Uh, so that's not an easy problem to solve. This is another one of those run simulation for a week to get one data point kind of things. Um, and that's what we did for this paper. So I was eager for something that would work better. Uh, and then on the other side here, we've got roll damping. So 
roll damping is, I, earlier I showed that picture of the container ship being blown over by a gust. In that case, it ran into the Suez Canal, but out in the open water, that kind of gust might instead just topple over three quarters of your cargo. Um, so trying to stop that sort of thing from happening, we can put some additional damping bilge keels on here. And as you do that, they're gonna stir up the water and take a bunch of the energy out of this roll motion. And again, this is just gonna be a really, really expensive simulation to run. In this case, I haven't even done the full ship. It's just a relatively uh, short section of a ship, but you can still see that there's a lot of computational difficulty there. So here's our two situations. Going back to the ship motions, um, what we have are linear physics-based models that we can use for this sort of thing. So we can linearize that whole problem, use potential flow and things like that. I won't go into the details of those solvers, um, but it is the sort of thing that we know how to do. And it won't give you a particularly accurate result. It's about 20% error on the peaks of motions that you get from the linear uh, thing versus some nonlinear equations or experiments, but they're okay. Um, you can also try using a black box machine learning tool. So here in blue, I've done some, uh, I think this was, this is a long time ago still. So this is 2013. I think this was kernel ridge regression, I'm pretty sure, using Gaussian kernels. Um, and you can tune those and you could use whatever you wanted. You could use anything, a Bayesian update, parameter estimation, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is we've only got kind of order magnitude 10 data points and that's gonna be hard to do no matter what. So here I'm looking at three different speeds. So food number is basically a reference for your forward speed and then across different wavelengths of incoming waves and then how large is your response heave motion. And I've only given data from the lowest speed and the highest speed and I'm trying to see how well does that generalize to an unseen speed? How well? Terribly, it doesn't work at all. Um, this black box machine learning approach can't handle how nonlinear this is. Um, it's, and this is after non-dimensionalization and proper physical scaling. So we need something more in this case. Um, by integrating that linear model, and in that case, we took this kind of Taylor series expansion and used that as the basis functions for this same exact ridge regression model. Um, and the results are phenomenal. Right, so the linear physics was capturing, that linear solver was capturing the importance between these two and by giving it just a few data points was able to correct the problems in the linear model. Uh, yeah, so that's a ridiculously successful example. And again, you can grab that online, it's on archive um, from long ago. Uh, the roll damping is something we're working on with now with Marin. Uh, that's the, again the Netherlands Research Institute. And we're doing the same kind of thing, except we don't really have a good model for roll damping. It's an inherently viscous thing. So we're left with kind of semi-empirical models. So here in the orange, I've got the results for a semi-empirical model that I'm fitting with different numbers of data sets. So I've run those simulations I showed you, I ran a thousand of them uh, for different size bilge keels, different amplitudes, different frequencies, things like that. Then I'm subsampling that to figure out what the dependence on data is. So in blue, again, using polynomial ridge regression, this time I'm taking it and we can get the score, the R squared explained variance score to be perfect on how much energy is taken out by that damping motion, as long as we give it on the order of 300 data points. But 300 of those simulations is many more than I want to do. And if we go down to 10 or 20, then essentially you're explaining none of the variance. Um, so that's uh, completely inadequate for these low sets of data. The semi-empirical model was uh, provided by Aikida in Japan uh, about 20 years ago. And that works OK. In this case, I've set to tune that model based on this specific set of data, but I've just kind of done a parameter estimation of that. And what we see is that it works much better, but it never learns anything. There isn't enough learning capacity in that model by itself. And so it can't improve even with a thousand data points. We're just reducing our uncertainty on a bad set of parameters. Um, and so by combining these two things, you essentially get the best of both worlds. So in this 
using this semi-empirical model as the basis, again, with a, just in this case, I think we just did a, a simple addition, but we're essentially still working on this one. But the preliminary lo results look pretty good. And you never do worse than the semi-empirical model, and you very quickly do a lot better. And you always do as well as the polynomial model as you add data points. And so that's kind of the big advantage of this, is that if you're doing 20 or 30 simulations, this lets you avoid the problem of trying to overfit this nonlinear function by itself. You're getting a hint from the physics to help you quickly use that 20 or 30 data points as best as you can. If you are in a situation where you have a couple thousand data points, then you probably don't need this kind of approach for this problem. This is five design variables. Of course, if you had 100 design variables, you'd need a lot more than 1,000 data points. OK, so those are the first class of problems I wanted to talk about. So I thought it'd be good to give a little quick summary. So the physics-based, feature-based approach, it's really good for flexibly combining existing engineering models with existing data. Um, it requires regularization. So you have to be highly regularized. You have to use some kind of a ridge model or you could use a Bayesian approach to, for regularization. That's really important. It can lead to nice interpretable models. So really Cindy, the sparse identification nonlinear systems developed uh, in Washington, that's exactly this kind of thing. They're just taking that to the extreme where they bring that down to only say three or four basis functions by the end of it. And then they can look at exactly what those three or four basis functions are and try to interpret that physically afterward. Um, and that does require a lot of understanding, right? You have to be able to pump in these things. You have to have the domain knowledge and the data and the models and some machine learning experience too. So when people go off and try to do this themselves, it can be uh, troublesome. Okay, let's move on going a little bit quicker. Um, the next thing I want to talk about was turbulent closure models. So the goal of here is to take those CFD simulations and speed them up by using a coarse grid and then modeling the unresolved scales. So we can do that kind of in time average sense. We can average over small eddies. That gives us a large eddy simulation. Or what I want to talk about today is you could average over the span. So if you have some slender structure, you can average over one entire dimension of the flow field. Um, once you have decided to do that, you have kind of two options. You can put the flow solver in the loop, which generally gives you kind of a data assimilation framework, or you can train the closure model independently. So that's a pure data-driven closure, and that's the one we're going to be doing. So basically, we're going to have our fluid simulation for the update, and then we'll correct that simulation with some closure terms. The application I wanted to show is uh, kind of vortex-induced vibrations. So anytime you have really long slender structures in a current, you're going to get vortex shedding off of that structure, and that'll cause them to vibrate. Uh, you cannot possibly do direct numerical simulation on something like this because your longest length scales, the length scales of the riser, are maybe a kilometer. And then you've got the turbulent length scales, which are down to micrometers, right? So you've got 10 orders of magnitude. That's not happening. Um, so what we're left with is trying to do tiny little sections of it, as I've done here in this simulation. Um, and we can't scale this. It's, it's not going to happen. So instead, what we'd like to do uh, is to try to think about some fast model of how we're going to do this. We do have the computational resources to run 2D simulations, and you might think that would be fine because the body is almost two-dimensional, um, but the flow isn't. So on the top here, I'm showing the two-dimensional simulation past a circular cylinder at a Reynolds number of probably around 10,000. Uh, and in 2D, versus 3D, a slice of that similar simulation, you can see that they're qualitatively different. Uh, there's an inverse energy cascade in 2D turbulence, which means that instead of getting breakdown in the little eddies, you get giant swirling eddies. And so the forces in these two objects are completely different. The motions, the stresses, everything is going to be completely different. So we need something else. What are we going to do? Instead of trying to do a 2D simulation, uh, which isn't going to work. 
let's span wise average the flow. So just like we would be time averaging to get a Reynolds average now of your Stokes simulation, we can just instead average along one of the coordinate directions, whatever the direction of cylinder change is. So in this case, that's Z. So we'll just take a simple average and then we'll break our, cell, our fluctuating quantity down into the mean and the fluctuation. If you plug that back in to the Navier-Stokes equation and you're careful with your math, then what you end up with is a 2D equation with what looks like the normal RANS stress term. But in this case, it's not a time average stress, it's this span-wise average residual stress. Um, and we've got a paper that just came out this year that goes into the details of the math of this. So this looks just like the 2D RANS equations. They're functionally identical, but the physics are completely different. So to really drill that point home, here's a Taylor Green vortex. So this is a classic case. The initial condition is just kind of a cosine variation of the flow, but it breaks down into turbulence spontaneously. And we can do a kind of exercise of what would we get if we did a 2D simulation of this kind of thing versus what is the spanwise average of this flow give you? And we can see that they are as completely different as you could want. So on the left here, I'm doing a simulation uh, and showing the vortex cores. On the right, I'm doing the vorticity. So the first row is the slice through this thing, uh, through this kind of maximum plane here showing the rotation in Z. And then we can take that and we can spanwise average it. And what we see is that the spanwise average at first, there's almost nothing going on. There's very little spanwise average flow. But over time, that flow grows and grows. And that's because a 3D flow has vortex stretching. We don't have a constant energy or entropy. Everything's fluctuating in these trees. Whereas if we initialize a 2D simulation with this 3D spanwise average, nothing happens. All we get is decay from viscosity, that's all. So we cannot consider this to be just a 2D simulation. Those spanwise average stresses are doing a lot of work. So because of that, basically, there is no closure model in the literature that will work for this at all your kind of classy, classic eddy viscosity model that you get for RANS or LES, they're completely uncorrelated. They, they don't work even a little. Um, so we used a convolutional neural network instead. So CNNs are really good for uncovering uh, nonlinear spatial relationships. Obviously, they're used in a lot of image processing kind of work. And they're perfect for this sort of thing. So we feed in a set of inputs, which are the kind of resolved scales from the 3D average. And we ask it to reconstruct the images of the uh, turbulent fluctuations, that uh, spanwise stress. And we train it on one simulation. So we ran one large scale simulation and we just took different time instances throughout that simulation. And also for every one simulation, we're only using a small portion of that flow field as the input and the output. So by running one simulation, we can get many thousands of uh, small input and output pairs. And this, to my knowledge, is the first time where anybody actually needed to use a CNN to do turbulence modeling. All the other examples I've seen, people were kind of holding their arm behind their back, saying, if I didn't know anything about turbulence, then maybe I could just do this black box. But in this case, we really don't know. We don't know how this works. Uh, we needed to go to this machine learning solution. And it did end up doing a remarkably good job. So here's the results. So on the top here is this uh, fluctuating term. So this is one of these weird stresses. And this is from the 3D simulation. And on the bottom is the CNN output. And you can see that it's uh, ridiculously good. Uh, the correlation is much better than 90% uh, on this, which is excellent for turbulence modeling. Turbulence modeling, we're happy to be in the 80s usually. This is something like 95. Um, here's, again, kind of some of those slices of the vorticity now in the wake of the circular cylinder. On the top is the 3D simulation. 
On the bottom is the spanwise average using the CNN's version of the closure model after a couple convection cycles. So we've started with the initial condition, we've run it forward in time with this turbulence model in the loop, and it still looks fully three-dimensional. Um, and we can see what happens again, like we did for the Taylor Green Vortex. If we don't add that closure term, it immediately starts becoming a 2D flow again. So we're getting that inverse energy cascade building up giant vortices. And the force results make that really clear. So we have, again, all three starting from the same initial condition. The black is the 3D, so that's our ground truth. The red is the SANS plus the convolutional neural network, which does a pretty good job. Is it perfect? No, but it's pretty good. It matches the amplitude and the period quite well. Uh, and the 2D flow immediately diverges and starts getting a completely different answer, especially bad in the relative size of the track. So if you tried to use this for your force estimates, 2D would be terrible. Whereas our SANS situation, we could actually use this and we could do these independent slices all the way along a kilometer long riser. So that's okay, but that was just the one simulation that we had already showed it. So the question is always, does this generalize? And the answer is yes. We were not 100% hopeful, but it really does generalize. So here are two unseen Reynolds numbers. So the top is 40,000 and the bottom is 10,000. You can see we're starting to get pretty laminar in the wake there. But we still do a really good job. Oh, sorry, the left is the true 3D simulation and the right is the CNN. Um, and again, uh, we're showing that same turbulent stress term that we had in the previous video. How about unseen geometries? The bottom two rows are now, instead of being a circular geometry, which was again, the only data set that was given, now we're doing a two to one ellipse or a one to two ellipse. And again, the results are really pretty good. Um, and so we were really impressed. We weren't sure this was gonna generalize as well as it did, but apparently the CNN really did figure out something about this closure um, and it does generalize relatively well. So the kind of takeaway here was that we're getting 90 to 99% accurate uh, representations of that 3D flow and it's running 200 times faster than the 3D simulation. Uh, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> so that's in that uh, journal of computational physics paper that just came out. Uh, that 200 times faster includes the, you know, running the, the forward scan of the, the CNN. Not training, of course, but the evaluation and the data transfer, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. Um, yeah, the generalization is good. And we didn't have to write a new 2D solver. We just had to import the closures. Of course, this is limited to cylinder geometries, um, but there are a lot of those. So wings, towers, struts, poles, whatever. There's a lot of engineering cases where this would be applicable. Um, there is, however, a two language problem here. So uh, the solver is a high performance computing solver in Fortran. The CNN was in TensorFlow in Python. And we had to figure out how to make these two things talk to each other. And that was not a lot of fun. Um, so I'm going to skip the very last bit of my talk because I'm out of time. But I did want to show you this. So the next step on this is Water Lily. Uh, so this is a solver written in pure Julia because Julia's got this active scientific community where people are doing high level GPU computing, they're doing automatic differentiation, they're doing scientific machine learning. And so having a tool like this in the loop, we're not gonna have to have adjoints or reduced order modeling with the tools that the other people are using and just have the Julia code running, maybe again, kind of actively, not batch running, but real time running uh, to get this kind of stuff. And potentially we can use this for some physics-based loss function stuff, but I'm gonna to have to skip that by the for today. So let's skip it and go to the last slide. So in summary, hydrodynamics, it's beautiful. It's a very rich field. It's very demanding. Uh, solvers are getting faster, but machine learning offers really disruptive levels of speed up. If you tell some of these engineering companies that they could get their CFD 200 times faster, 
they will hand you however much money you ask for. Um, but to do that, we need to watch out for some of these pitfalls. Uh, so there was recently a nature paper that just came out on the fact that there were 300, more than 300 AI models for uh, CT scans going to diagnose COVID uh, and that not a single one of those was useful because they hadn't done a good job looking through uh, the data that they were using. They hadn't thought about how these models would actually be used in the clinical sense. Um, and we have similar problems here. So I've, again, seen a lot of people only trying out their applications on simple linear problems. That's not helpful. You have to push it. Um, there's a lot of issues with sparse or unavailable critical data and trying to overcome that is a big uh, problem. And then there's a lot of people, again, trying to ignore domain knowledge and come up with some perfect one, one solution fits all. Uh, and I think that's gonna be a big mistake. So that's it for me. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions that I left time for. Yeah, it was not so bad. 40 minutes on the dot. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Um, that was fantastic. Um, really well structured and very eloquently described. Um, in the meantime, I'll ask those Thanks. who have any questions to um, post the questions. Um, if you can find the raise hand, that, oh, okay, Th Temis is raising his hand. <laughs> Would you like to talk? No, no, sorry, I was clapping. <laughs> <laughs> How they look the same. Uh, okay, yeah. so uh, feel free to, to write the questions in the, in the chat uh, section. Um, or um, unmute your mic and, and ask directly. I, I think we can um, go a little bit free flow. Okay, we do have a question. Um, a question from Martin. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I gave that was a fascinating talk. Um, so just picking up on the, on the last topic you spoke about. Um, so you showed these, these Taylor Green vortices and I was just I was just wondering how you ended up with, with these these absolutely gorgeous symmetric profiles because you wouldn't expect that in turbulence right because it's random yeah this is before they've broken down into full turbulence so we're only going for t star so for 10 convective cycles so about now on that video that's playing um, so if you go any later, so I, can I draw on this? Oh man, free form, free form. So, <laughs> um, so if you think about like the kinetic energy of the flow here, like I said, it's not a constant. And what you yeah. see is that you get a growth in kinetic energy due to Vortex stretching. And the peak of that is around 10. Um, and then you start decaying into your more standard 3D turbulent decay on yes. this side. So you're right. I've, well, I think my student cherry picked uh, time steps that gave beautiful pictures here. Well, it is, um, it is beautiful. <laughs> um, so so the, 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 the question um, I had was, was so you, you went to your sums equations afterwards and, yeah. and you had this kind of this subgrid model based on CCNs. It, can, you, can you figure out what, what the CCN is doing? That's always the hard thing, isn't it? it absolutely. And, and you're right on where we want to go with this next, right? The fact that the CNN was able to find something that worked so well and that generalized pretty well tells you that there's something a human should be able to understand in there. Um, it's not cat videos, you know, like, like there has to be some physics in there that we can get out of this thing. And that's definitely the next step. Again, I think that's going to involve more of the kind of constraining down. So probably something kind of like the, the physics-based generator or the Cindy approach where instead of giving it a total freeform CNN, we'll say here, have a variety of choices and then we can force it to constrain down and down and down until we can get to kind of the most important pieces of, of what it's doing. 
all of that work is going to be so much easier if we pull that into a unified framework rather than trying to have some of it in Fortran and some of it in Python. This actually is a water lily simulation here um, that I'm showing. So we've we've got that sort of thing, but you you may have noticed that's just one box. <laughs> that's not uh, running a giant huge simulation yet. So that's kind of a limitation. But hopefully we could do some of this kind of testing of turbulence closure ideas in this smaller water lily kind of framework, and then we could use them uh, in the HPC. Because once you understand it, then we could code it up ourselves, and we don't need to link it into Python again. Great, thanks. But great question. That's ab absolutely important. So there is a question on the chat. Paul, so how do you apply the 2D spanwise models when trying to simulate overall behavior of a kilometer long riser? I think you said something about applying them, but how do you know how far apart they're going to have to be? Oh no, not a stupid question. The truth is I glossed over that um, because to do this really well is probably going to require first having that understanding um, from the previous question. So at this point, we haven't uh, done that step yet. There's one other thing which I also glossed over, which is that this kind of simplified breakdown here um, is for periodic flows. So I was assuming in this simplified setup that whatever's happening in this spanwise average is it happening exactly the same in this one and exactly the same in that one. And that's definitely not going to be true along a vibrating object. So we need to add in a term to account for a difference in the boundary conditions between the two edges of a spanwise region, but that's, it's not very complicated. But the idea then is that you'd have these different things and they'd be linked through their boundary conditions, right? So you'd have these different uh, spanwise average regions and each of these would be vibrating up and down at you know, different times and slightly different phases and different amplitudes. There'd be a governing equation linking these together. So some kind of a string equation probably. And based on the where the body is at this particular moment, you have an FSI problem. So you'll just have a, a bunch of coupled uh, fluids models coupled together through this string equation boundary condition. And people have done this sort of thing. Actually, they've done it with 2D strips. They just have to take those 2D strips and damp them out completely non-physically and get totally ridiculous answers. But the kind of the mathematical framework for setting up some sort of distributed model like that, that does exist. Um, so it should be okay. And again, you could do the same thing on an airplane wing for aeroelastics. You could do the same thing on a, on a tower for a civil engineering application. Thank you very much. You guys are really lucky I didn't find out about that pin until just now. Man, I would have been writing all over the place. Can I ask a question? Um, yes, please. I raised the hand, but it's, it's yes, I disappeared. Yes, I was on mute. <laughs> so this is really cool. And I'm wondering exactly on, on this slide that you are showing about compressibility. I think ah. Incompressible flows are fine for terrestrial uh, fluid dynamics, but if you go to space, if you do astrophysics, you have highly compressible flows and they are often in the supersonic and highly magnetized domain. So I'm wondering how you could um, expand this approach uh, or whether you have thought about it. I, I certainly haven't. In, in maritime, we're firmly stuck in incompressible flow, which is usually our main hindrance, right? Because it means we have to solve the giant Poisson equation, which is almost always the bottleneck. Um, so I would, I would hope that getting rid of the Poisson incompressibility condition would help speed up the simulations off the bat. But could no, the same don't. idea be extended? It doesn't speed them up? No, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> So other, other shockwave fun things must come in instead. So I, I haven't thought about 
the extension of this, but I guess the main issue, I, I don't see what fundamentally wouldn't extend. I think this stuff about the variable boundary conditions would be especially important um, if you had any kind of shock structures moving through one of one region to another, that seems like it would be uh, tricky. And of course, this whole thing only makes sense if you can, if you do have some direction in which those flow structures are, in a sense, less important, that you can average over them. Uh, but as long as that was the case, I don't see why this idea wouldn't extend. Um, you just have to go through the math again and make sure that, that you're equations that come out the other end are still kind of a usable form. Um, so in this case, we get a really nice set of equations that are totally decoupled from the spanwise flow. Um, I'm wondering, have, have you thought about fully isotropic flows? Yeah. It yeah. should, in principle, work there as well, because then you can also isolate one direction and keep the other two intact. Yes, that's true. Yeah, we, we have looked at that. And we've looked at a couple other kind of canonical situations like that as well. And, it, and those also did work. Again, uh, some of the trouble there is you don't want to get stuck um, kind of just resolving for scaling laws that we knew at the beginning. Um, so we were trying to apply this to a situation that you know, a, a turbulent cylinder wake is still something that we can't describe. So, so that was something we were going for, but, but we didn't take that application further forward, but it should uh, apply fine in that case. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. There is one we have, more. We have a question in. from uh, Peter. So I'll ask to unmute. Hello. Uh, a Hello. quick. Uh, thank you for the talk. A quick question. How would you implement a, a conservation law if you had on top of this something like a conservation law? How would you go about that? Thank you. So that was the topic I didn't get to talk about. <laughs> so, uh, so the idea of using conservation laws as some kind of a loss function for machine learning is another really attractive approach. Um, in particular, Carney Adakis at Brown and some colleagues at MIT have developed these physics-informed neural networks. And the idea is very good. So they basically are coming up with full field predictions based on a deep neural network. Um, so they're really just trying to make, like you put in the value of the points that you're interested in in time and space, and it spits out all of the field variables you're interested in. Um, and you train that very large network on whatever data you have at first, and then you refine that model using the five base laws. So whatever kind of governing equation you have, how do you do that? Well, what's really great about automatic differentiation is that you don't need to sample in order to figure out how to do this, you can instead just literally take the derivative of this giant DNN with respect to all the different directions and time and you know, literally plug that in to the exact governing equation. So you have you know, inner product of giant neural network plus time derivative of giant neural network. And if you tried to do this out any kind of a normal numerical approach, it would blow your mind. You could never code it. Um, but that doesn't matter because automatic differentiation is just going to chug through it as happily as ever. Um, and that takes the conservation law into account. That's the conservation that law. That is the, the conservation law. Yeah, this is the conservation law. It's the exact conservation law. You can write it down. Um, and that's a really neat idea for one, because now you don't have to be good at taking numerical derivatives anymore. Like, I don't need to know the best way to discretize this. I don't need to know if it's, uh, you know, oh, that I should be using a flux treatment here or something like that. None of that matters anymore. Um, and it means you can quickly jump to another field. So you go to compressible flow, no problem. I'll just change the governing equation. Take me three seconds. And no problem, I'll just switch over. So these guys, like in the span of one year have written papers in maybe six fundamentally different fields. So they're like in chemistry reactive flows, 
and then they're down in protein folding the next day. And that's because this tool is super general because that same machinery can be applied no matter what your conservation law is. Is this a magic bullet, which is gonna make CFD uh, useless tomorrow? No, I really don't think so. The first thing is that you're absolutely implicitly modeling all of the unresolved physics, right? So I just said that you'd be doing the exact governing equation, but that's actually a problem. That's not a good thing, that's a bad thing. Because the exact governing equation only applies if I can resolve every single minuscule scale, right? So I need to resolve every tiny eddy. They showed a simulation of the Gulf of Mexico and they used the exact governing equation. And you're like, oh my God, you are not resolving every scale in the Gulf of Mexico flow. Um, and it's not like they don't know that. Karniadakis is like astoundingly good at this stuff. He knows exactly what he's going into. It just means that they're doing a ton of implicit modeling. Uh, so that seems dangerous to me and possibly not as good as doing some explicit modeling instead. Um, and then the second thing is that, of course, this can be really slow because it's a gigantic deep neural network and you're using automatic differentiation instead of the much, much faster. Uh, it's not a finite differences or something like that. So I would say we should do the same thing, except we shouldn't throw out the CFD solver. So CFD solvers are really good at getting residuals at, at applying governing equations, right? So if you throw it an output function like this, it can check instantly how, how far off are you from the governing equations. Um, plus, if you did it that way, then you could use whenever you had trained it and made this function, then you could immediately use that as a hot start for a CFD solve. And that's exactly the kind of thing that all of the companies I talk to want, right? They say, I run 10 simulations. Is there any way you can make my next 10 simulations run 100 times faster? Actually, yes. If we could figure this out, I could give you your best guess at the initial conditions for the next simulation. And all you have to do is you know, take the sharp edges off that using the CFD solver that you already know how to use and trust. Um, but that's a hard problem. I have not cracked it. So we need to be able to generate fields from a very sparse number of examples. Uh, and that's tricky. So we've tried a couple different things. Kringing is one that we tried uh, on this problem here, so a high-speed craft. And it worked OK, but there really just wasn't enough learning capacity. Um, so we couldn't take the residuals down as low as we wanted in the learnings. I tried optimal transport last year. That didn't work at all. <laughs> it was a terrible, a terrible choice. Optimal transport seems perfect because it's a way of taking one solution and morphing it into another solution. So it seems like a perfect way to do it, but it's really slow and there's almost no opportunity for putting learning capacity in it. So I want like incredibly suboptimal transport uh, and I'm gonna have to figure out how to do that, I guess. We also tried, well, I didn't try, a related group tried some evolutionary interpolation stuff uh, that broke the computer because the data sets are too big. Um, so, I mean, the, this, you know, you're talking about a, a million dimensional vector and that's not the sort of thing that uh, evolutionary algorithms like to deal with. So I don't know how to do this yet, to be honest, we're working on it. But maybe soon, uh, Simmons is really interested in this. They want this to be a feature where the client runs 10 simulations, and then they say, give me your best guess at the next 10 simulations. And it just auto makes it. And then you can pick the ones you think look best, and the solver will start from that as a hot start and give you the refined solution. So it's a, a really nice plug and play situation. So good question, Peter. Thank you for letting me talk about my last two slides. <laughs> Excellent. Um, is there are there any other uh, pressing questions? I seems not. Um, I, I have one quick question if I can ask, um, but I don't want to keep. Yeah, Zach. It. It's just about interpretability. Um, so we spoke a lot about the uh, data efficiency of, of this approach, but uh, can you make a sort of general comment? Um, on the interpretability of the methods and how and the trade-off between interpretability and the three methods, the three approaches you, you discussed. Yeah, sure. So like I said, the first method is very good for interpretability because you're 
forcing the input space into a physics based space that you kind of already understand because you're using these older models that you already have in hand. Um, and you're regularizing heavily. So you're not going to have a super high dimensional space. You can push it down into something. And like I said, in the limit of kind of the Cindy approach, you force that into just like, give me the, the, the highest modes. So it's at least as good for interpretability as um, you know, your proper orthogonal decomposition kind of approaches. Um, so I think that's really good. I think this one is also actually good for interpretability uh, because in, in the case of the kind of give me, give me your best guess at the next flow field, uh, what you get out of it is you'll get a picture of the flow field. So instead of just getting a number like the drag or the moment on this boat or does the, you know, does the Suez Canal get blocked with something, here you actually get to see it. And so you get the full field output. And that's another thing that the engineer really wants. They don't just want the engineered number. They want to be able to look and go, oh, this is a breaking wave case. Oh, look, that rooster tail is really under-resolved. I think I'm going to have to think about that. Uh, and that'll give you that sort of thing. So from uh, a trained engineer, I think this is pretty good. And then I think we talked about the fact that the, the CNN really isn't interpretable. Uh, right now. So it's doing a wonderful job and I have no idea why. Uh, and that's the problem with the black box stuff. And it doesn't mean that you stop. You, that's like a reason to just keep going until you understand what's going on here. And you, I can replace the CNN with something else once I understand it better. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So with that, I guess, unless Temis and Andrea have anything else to say. Uh, yeah. Many thanks, Gabe. That was really, really cool. Um, and to everyone, we will host our next seminar in approximately two weeks. Um, and I'll definitely, we'll definitely be sending out, um, you know, more information about that, including the, the obviously the calendar invite. Um, and again, if you would like to, uh, to share your work with with this community, then feel free to uh, to text us, to email us, and we'll be happy to have a chat and arrange um, a time slot. So yeah, um, as, is, as is common now, I could say stay safe, <laughs> but uh, well done and uh, thanks again. Thank you, Zach. Bye, Gabe. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Bye-bye.